said, my name is Joe Crumry. My wife Abby and I uh, founded River Valley Raptors uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it's been probably four now that our that our foundation has been going. Um, just a little bit about us before we get to the birds. I, you know, I know everybody's excited to get to the birds, but we gotta got to learn the history of where we came from and how we got into this, right? So, me and Abby are both originally from the Driftless area. She's from Winona, I'm from Mondovi, Wisconsin, uh, right in the heart of the Driftless area. So, after we, w we both went to college at Stevens Point, uh, did other jobs in the eastern part of the state, and we're, we so loved the Driftless area that we wanted to move back. Wanted to be around our families because we were starting a family. You can see my little daughter Lila there tags along with us too. Uh, she might run around during the program, but she's been to more of these than most of you guys have. So, um, so we really wanted to move back to this area, and that's where we got River Valley Raptors. Because we do really like to talk about how Raptors use this river valley and how this Driftless area and the river is such a special place. Um, from a part of the rest of the world. So that's really one of the things we have to focus on. Um, and starting out four years ago, you know, we decided like, oh, we're just going to do this little little side thing. Uh, we're just going to have a couple of raptors and kind of just do school programs that come up with stuff like this. Um, we started out with three raptors. Now I have 16. <laughs> so needless to say that exploded way faster than we we wanted it to but there was such a draw there's such a need for us to come out and do programs you know before this whole pandemic thing we were doing two and three and four programs every weekend um, throughout the whole summer so we needed that rotation of those birds you know just to give those birds a break otherwise just those three birds that have just been working their tails off traveling around the state uh, in an area just to kind of do that education we did so we got a variety of birds. We brought four different raptors for you today. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and get started with the first raptor. She's in this box right here. Um, and <coughs> she's gonna be a type of hawk. Now I'm assuming you, most of you guys are rap, friends of raptors, right? You either watch the, the Eagle Cam or the Kestrel Cam or things like that. Um, so we're gonna try to give you guys some neat information that you guys might not learn off of some of those cameras, right? So we got a species of hawk, and we have seven different species of hawks that live in the upper Midwest here. Do you guys know those species? I heard red tail? Sharp shan, cooper socks? Broad wing? It's like an auction, who can get the best one? Red shoulders. Red shoulders, we said sharp shan already. Said Coopers. Um, oh, Said Broadwing. We don't get Swainsons, not with sometimes, every once in a while, Mike. But I don't count that one. Huh? Nope, just the hawks. Gossock. Chicken hawk is another name for a red tail. It's a colloquial name for a red tail. But we're missing a. We got six. We're missing a migrant that comes down from the Arctic. They're about the size of a red tail. They got really rough legs. A rough leg in them, right? So those are the seven, the seven different types of hawks that we can find uh, in the upper Midwest, at least, at least in Wisconsin, which is where we primarily do our education. I gotta remember I'm in Iowa now. But I'm going to go ahead and get on our first bird, and we're going to see if you guys can identify what type of bird she is. Anybody know what type of bird it is? Is it a red tail? No. Doesn't have a red tail. Nope. That could be a trick because red tails don't have tails the first year of their life. Red tails the first year of their life. This is a northern gossock. Yeah, so this bird's name is Ariel. She is a northern gossock. Now hawks in general, so gossocks, red tails, they're perfect examples of what makes raptors raptors. So if you think about eagles, hawks, falcons, owls, all those different raptors versus a robin or versus a blue jay 
there's three things that make them separate from those other songbirds. What's one of them? Talents. Talents, yeah. Sharp, gripping, grasping talents, right? The word raptor actually comes from the Latin word rapier, which means to grip, to grasp, or how you use it to seize. That's exactly what they use those talons for. They grab a hold of prey and they crush. That's how they capture their prey animals. So that's a big thing that makes them raptors. What's another one that makes them raptors? The beak. The beak. What about their beak? It's downward curve, right? A woodpecker's beak is sharp, but not in this downward curve. Yeah, that beak is a meat hook. That's exactly what they use that beak for, right? There's not a bird alive that has teeth in their mouth. They just don't have teeth. So they can't chew anything. So they need to be able to rip off small enough chunks so she can swallow them whole. Now a small enough chunk for her is about the size of a large mouse. That's a small enough chunk for her. And she can swallow that whole. So we got sharp, gripping, grasping talons. We got a downward curve to their beak. What's the third thing that separates them? Eyes. eyes. What about their eyes? They got a little more forward facing to their eyes. But it's how they can see and how powerful that eyesight is that really separates them. They got long range eyesight. Yeah, so their eyesight's about, depending on what study you read, seven to ten times better than a human's. It's been said that if they could read, they could read a newspaper at over a football field away. Now some of us can't read a newspaper at three feet. <laughs> yeah, because you gotta use cheaters. But the neat thing about raptors is they don't have any degenerative eye diseases. Their eyes do not get bad. If you think about it, if their eyes go bad, they die. They can't find food. So that genetically gets selected out of their system. So there's not a raptor alive today that has bad eyes. Unless it's in captivity, a wild raptor. So yeah, those are the three things that make raptors raptors. Think about the talons, the beak, and the eyes. They're all separate from all those, all those other little birds out there. Now, a little more about goshawks in particular. Uh, Ariel here, I actually have had Ariel since she's been about eight days old. Um, along with running our business, me and my wife are both falconers also. So we fly birds to hunt with them. So she is going to be my hunting partner for this fall. Um, so I located a nest really early this spring. And then with permission from the DNR and the federal government, I actually climbed the nest tree and took her from the nest in the wild. Now it seems a little, little weird that we are able to do that, but it works twofold. I get my falconry bird and she's got almost 100% chance of survival. And her brother and her sister that were also in the nest, their chance of survival went up also, because now there's, not one, there's one less mouth for mom to feed. And mom was not happy, let me tell you that. <laughs> I got a couple of scars to come back, so I, I earned you, didn't I? Yeah. Her nest was about her nest was about 40 foot up in the air. So northern goshawks have a very specific habitat requirement that they need to order a nest. They have almost they need almost pristine woodland with very clear under undergrowth with no brush, no nothing, so they can fly through the forest. They are a woodland raptor. You hardly ever see goshawks flying out in the open like in an open field. They hunt things in the woodland, right? So they need that open, no brush to zig and zag and dodge those trees and chase down their favorite food, which is grouse. They love to eat and catch grouse in the Northwood. Her nest was 50 miles from the UP Michigan border. That's how far Now, Ariel's in her juvenile plumage. She is a first-year bird. She's only about two and a half months old. And she is fully grown and ready to go. What am I going to hunt with it? Yeah. So I, my, my two-man hunt a rabbit and squirrels. 
cocktail rabbit and squirrels. But with a bird of, of this type, it opens up my variety a lot. So I can chase pheasants, I can chase jocks, ducks, jackrabbits, uh, quail if I can find them, if I take a trip out west or something like that. How they cut those flowers at. One more thing about her plumage, she's got this dark brown kind of cream color to her. She ages. She's going to change colors. She's going to get like a slate blue gray back to her. She's going to get this very kind of grayish white color to her breast with instead of polka dots like she has now, she's going to get like streaky on her breast. And then her eyes are kind of like a tannish blue color now. They're going to change into yellow and then they're going to change into like this ruby kind of blood red color when she's an adult. She's full grown. Yep. Oh, yep. well. Nope, her beak is going to stay the same. So I've got plenty more birds to give you guys. I'm going to flip it over to Abby, and she's going to work on the next species, right? Yeah. yeah. How long yeah. do you expect to have her? I'll have her pretty much forever. How long is this for Well, their lifespan in captivity, she'll be 20 years plus. Yep. Well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you guys got to see a hawk. Um, next up, we're gonna take a uh, take out a falcon for you guys, and then lastly, we do have an owl. Um, we have a golden e or an eagle at home, a golden eagle, um, but he's still getting trained for uh, programs. So at some point, we'll be able to bring all four of the major groups of raptors. Um, but until then, I'm gonna grab out our falcon. We have three falcons you can find, uh, at least in Wisconsin, I think in Iowa too. You guys know what they are? Peregrine. Kestrel, what's that in between one? Merlin. Merlin, yeah. So, I'm going to get out the smallest falcon that we have in North America. This is Cyrus, short for Osiris. Um, you guys, that is odious. He's the American Kestrel. Now, he is estimated to be maybe six, five, five, six weeks old. So his tail hasn't quite grown out yet. And he's still got a little bit of fluff on top of his head. Uh, and actually, he's only been with us for about a week. Uh, he came to us last Thursday. And what happened was they were tearing down a church steeple when they discovered this nest of baby birds. Uh, so kestrels are cavity nesters. Oftentimes they use, people put up kestrel boxes for them to nest in. Well, this family had decided to nest in a church steeple, uh, which would have been a great idea, except that they wanted to tear it down. Now, unfortunately, they'd already torn down just enough of the steeple where the nest was no longer safe against predators. So they called the DNR, who called Joe because uh, he used to work for the DNR. And Joe said, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. Uh, so we were able to take uh, two of the babies and we are now, instead of taking them to a rehab center, uh, we're actually going to fly them for falconry so that they can go out, fly, and hunt before they go back to the wild. So he will get to go back and be a free bird again. Um, but he's first going to learn all those great hunting skills and hunting techniques before then. Um, now, the reason his name is Osiris is because his sister um, is named Isis. And so if you've ever heard of the Egyptian mythology, Isis and Osiris um, are brother and sister. Uh, now, a really cool thing about these guys is that males and females are actually different colors. So in most raptors, Males and females look exactly the same. But in the kestrel, the males actually have this beautiful blue color right on the edge of their wings. Whereas the female would have the brown and black on her wings, as well as a brown and black striped tail. They will not. So actually, kestrels are one of the few birds that, as a falconer, you typically have to go trap a young bird. They want you to take a first-year bird because you're giving that bird the best chance of survival. Anywhere from 50 to 90% of birds, of raptors, don't make it to see an adult age. 
So by taking a young bird, you're helping it through that hardest part of their life before letting it go back to the wild. The only reason kestrels are different is because it can be really difficult to tell the difference between a first-year kestrel and a five-year-old kestrel. So, yeah. Now, what kind of, what animal likes to eat kestrels? Yeah. Yeah, so in a nest, it could be predated by raccoons um, and mammals like that. It could also be taken by larger birds. So poopers, hawks um, would gladly come. Owls would gladly come and take a baby kestrel or even uh, an adult kestrel. So, now what we're going to do with these guys um, is we're actually going to hunt house sparrows and European starlings. Uh, so we're going to use them for invasive species control. Um, yeah, right? Yeah, so it's really cool. You can actually fly these guys right out your car window. So you can drive through the neighborhood, look for the starlings sitting on the ground, open your window and let them right out. So, we're going to have a lot of fun with these two, um, him and his sister. Um, now my last favorite fact, we're going to get out one more, oh, she already got them out, so we're good. My last favorite fact about these guys, though, is that these guys have the ability to hover. Um, so when they're chasing their prey, they'll actually stop and can fly in place if they're kind of keeping an eye on something. And they can, if I can get them to focus, look at this, they might not focus for us, they can keep their head still. He's like, I'm looking at everything right now. <laughs> hey, you. If we can get him to keep his head still. Might have to wait. Maybe when Maya gets over here with our other bird, he'll start staring at him. And I can get him. But I can move his body, and his head will stay straight. Yeah. But he's like, there's so much to look at right now. Um, so like I said, he's only been with us for a week and a day. Um, so we came, like I said, last Thursday. And already through positive reinforcement training, um, you know, the first couple of days, he was pretty scared. But, you know, we just offered him food, did let him do everything on his own, coming to us, hopping to the glove. And now he can go in front of a group of people and have no problem. So. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Maya, and she's going to tell you a few more facts about falcons. You want to? It's up to you. <laughs> what the fastest land animal is? Peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcon, that is absolutely right. Does anybody know what their top speed has been clocked at? 242 miles per hour. You want to know how they figured that out? They took a peregrine falcon up in an airplane, right? Put an altimeter on his leg, so measure time over distance gauge his speed, and then they threw his favorite toy out the window <laughs> and went to see how fast he swooped to catch it, and they got him at 242 miles per hour. They think that that was limited only by the height that they were flying at. They think that the Peregrine Falcons could potentially go faster than that, but that they might eventually lose control. So as you can imagine, everything about a Falcon is designed for speed. So, I'll show you a few things on our plan. Freddy here, Freddy the Peregrine Falcon. You can see to start, his wings are so long that they actually cross over behind his back. That in itself is an adaptation to speed. Also, his body is kind of hard to see here uh, with his hood on. Um, but his head is a little smaller and he has a very nice, sleek, teardrop shaped body. That is also an adaptation to speed. And if you look at his feet, you'll see he's got long, skinny toes and super sharp talons. So, how would you catch something in midair without breaking little skinny toes like that? Well, he doesn't catch it right away. He will punch his prey midair, called a falcon punch. They think that it has about enough force as that of a heavyweight boxer. So he punches him and then goes back and catches him with those long skinny toes that are designed for grabbing onto feathers. So Freddy being a falcon would feed on mostly uh, songbirds and other very small birds like pigeons, yellow pigeons. I'll see if I can get this photo for you. Maya, before you take the head off, wrap the rope around your fingers. And also, it's kind of hard to see with the foot on, but he has a little extra bone in his foot. What's that talking about? Yeah, of course. He has an extra bone in his nose that's shaped like a cone. 
It's kind of hard to see, but it's right inside of his nostril, and that is to help with airflow, so that when he is going 240 miles per hour, he doesn't have too much air in his lungs. So it's for breathing control. And also, on his beak, this isn't uh, about his beak, it's just an extra fun fact about Falcon. He has an extra notch inside his beak, and that is at the perfect distance, so that when he grabs his prey, he can use that notch to sever the spinal cord of the prey that he's eating. So he doesn't have to worry about grasping it or crushing it. He can just use that little notch and just flick right through. Okay, now I'm gonna Somewhere along the line, he did get hurt. Um, he sprained one of his wings, and then the vets that we take him to said, "So we do still fly him, but he will he will gain arthritis faster than one shoulder. The harder we work him, so he's on like a semi-early retirement at four years old." Yeah. So, yeah, he gets an extra pigeon bag every once in a while for retirement benefit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so his question is, do we have to feed them fresh meat? Do we have to feed these guys fresh animals? And the answer is, I'd love to, but it's just not economical for me to keep a big coop full of pigeons and pens full of rabbits and all this other stuff. So for the most part, we do feed frozen thawed food. Um, and we, you know, we get it donated to us. We purchase a lot of it. Um, the main thing we feed is a lot of rabbit, uh, just because we have a very big source of rabbit for us that somebody donates. They're, they breed for 4-H, and the ones that don't make ruster for 4-H, he just donates to us. And 
That's our that's our meal ticket there. But we buy lots of rats. We buy quail. And like doing all these programs basically goes into feeding these birds. We don't even get paid out of that deal. So it goes right in right back into the rafters and their equipment. So. They're getting these little kestrels are growing up. They're getting that famous kestrel tail bob here. Their tail gets a little longer. Yeah, unfortunately, populations of kestrels throughout the country have been declining um, over the last years. Yeah. Why? Why is that? Uh, insecticide use is a big one. These guys. on sparrows and starlings because there's no shortage of that. <laughs> well that's that's just she's asking how do when we our window after a sparrow or after a starling how how do we gain that confidence that he's gonna come back, right? And then eat the sparrow in the front seat of your car. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to ride in the front seat of our car. Uh, but so it's all it's all just approximations, right? So I don't start trying to call them from that truck. I start trying to call them from this close. And you gain that relationship and build up the distance and what they come. And pretty soon over you know a course of a week, I can have them jumping across a football field. They're flying to me across a football field. And then it's just transferring that into, okay, going out after a sparrow. If he doesn't get it, training him just to make the loop and come back to the car. Um, and if he gets it, hopefully I can stop the car fast enough to jump out. <laughs> or just jump out and hope for the best of the car. But. <laughs> so you carry little pieces of raw or whatever? Yep, when we're all hunting, i got a pocket full of raw cut up meat on me at all times. <laughs> yep, just as treats. And my the red tail I flew last year, I had, she was so good, I kept her for four years. She, I didn't have to have her fly to me. She'd just fly past like and throw a piece of food up in the air. And she would catch him and go land on the next branch and then just keep going. She didn't have to come down to me anymore. Yeah. But, yeah. the Yep, that's that's one of the things, too. Kestrels are little snacks for Cooper's hawks, unfortunately. Um, I've, I've known people that have hunted Kestrels and have Cooper's hawks try to come take them right off their glove. That's how all the Cooper's hawk is. Um, but yeah, the increase of urbanization, Cooper's hawks love little woodlots in towns and cities, and they're, they're predators to kestrels. So there's a whole bunch of things that kind of interweave there to not have the kestrel be. Luckily in Wisconsin, this upper Midwest, we're kind of a, a good stronghold for kestrels. We got enough wildlands left that um, they're doing pretty good up here. Not so much like in the center part of the U.S., but we're doing pretty good. But. We do got one more bird we gotta get to, so we're gonna shift into that motion there. Um, the last bird, we've seen a hawk, we've seen a falcon. I couldn't bring my eagle because he's still in training, like Abby said. What's the last type of raptor we gotta oh, see? Owls. Oh, owls, yeah. Everybody's excited about these these owls. There's a big owl craze that has been going on for years and years. But we like to take a second to to just learn about why owls are so much different. If there's even contemplating not... Hi. Are you going to play the, the crowd here? Are you going to talk? No? There's even contemplating not even having owls and hawks and falcons in the same family. They're just so different from each other. Right? So they, have, they do have a couple of different annotations that make them different than, say, the hawks and the falcons. One of the one you can see right on their feet all owls have some kind of feathering on their toes, right? One of the major reasons they have feathers on their toes, it serves a couple of different purposes. One, it helps dampen sound when they fly. But two, when the most owls hunt, at night, so they wear a pair of socks. <laughs> As compared to, say, like a red tail, that just has like a scaly foot, 
The next one has to do with their eyes, right? Look at the size of eye sockets this snowy owl has. An owl's eyes are actually so big, they need bony plates around their eyes to hold them into their skull. Okay? <laughs> that gives them all that power to gather all that light at nighttime and be able to see in low light uh, situations. So they have just such bigger eyes than the other ones. And then, have you guys all heard that owls, they fly silently? Right, they have that silent flight capability, which is totally awesome. But do you guys know why? You know how it works? You're going to learn. Yeah, it has to do with the feather structure. And it actually, how the stru all the feathers are made. So I have a red-tailed hawk feather and a great horned owl feather. A little bit different placement on the wing, that's why they look a little bit different but they overall are the same basic shape. If you look at them this way, they're curved like an airplane wing. Right? And overall very very similar to each other, but it's in the way this feather is designed and how soft this feather is. A red-tailed hawk feather is actually relatively stiff and relatively hard, if you can call a feather hard. Right? Whereas the great horned owl feather this feather is very flexible in terms of how it is, and especially this way on the veins of the feather. So I'm going to flap this feather, and we're going to see if we can hear it. And don't worry, i got a bigger demonstration if you can't hear it. So, you hear it flapping? Yeah. yeah. That's actually the feather, when they flap, this feather is actually catching the wind and flipping. That's what's making that sound. Now I'm going to flap the owl feather, and we're going to see if we can hear it. You don't hear it because this feather bends with the bends with the wind, okay? And it's got little ridges on the bottom of it that help cut that turbulence and make the sound. Here's my bigger demonstration. I got a hawk feather and an owl feather. Now they're paint sticks, so don't carry away. This isn't some exotic species of owl. But they work exactly the same way. They're the same shape, the same size, but what's different? The owl one's softer and it's got these ridges on it, right? Whereas this red-tailed hawk one is harder, it's a little bit stiffer. <coughs> so we'll spin this one and get it going. Come on. <coughs> I gotta get it spinning, right? There it goes. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> Right? But what's the feather doing? It's catching air and it's spinning. So let's get this other one going. And no matter how, if even if I started out spinning, I see how like, hard it is for me to swing it? Because it's catching air and it's not spinning that much. That's how owl's wings are designed. Isn't that cool? One of my favorite spots. Now I'm going to kick it over to Abby to bring out something even cooler, and that's our friend the owl. All right, so again, I know, uh, I know Wisconsin species, oh. but we have 11 different species of owls in Wisconsin, and this here is the smallest that we have. Just here's pulling out. There we go. Who knows what kind of owl this is? Solid owl, that's right. Now, you might notice he doesn't necessarily look like an adult solid owl, and that is because Darwin, or new name might be Winnie, Darwin may be a girl, um, is only, let's see, April, May, June, three months old. He is about three months. All right, but before we get into why we have her, uh, as you can see, she's got those feathers all the way down to her toes. She's got that big eyes, you can see, that are fixed inside of her head. And you notice, might notice that she has what's called a facial disc. And so that's actually gonna be able to help her hear. 
Now, I wasn't totally paying attention to what Joe was saying, so if I repeat information, I'm sorry. Um, but even though owls have really large eyes, they actually rely more on their hearing than they do on their eyesight. And so that facial dish, facial disc, actually helps grab sound and send it to those ears. Now, the cool thing about owls, though, is instead of having symmetrical ears like we do, they actually have an ear up high face forward and an ear down low face backwards. This allows them to collect sound from all over and do something called triangulation. So when you're watching maybe a video of an owl and they're kind of bobbing their head up and down, what they're doing is they're collecting that sound and triangulating. So they're able to find their prey just by hearing it. Now, barn owls have the best hearing out of any lab-tested animal, including humans. Their hearing is so good that they can detect that tiny mouse under two feet of snow. Figure out where that mouse is, crash in the snow and grab it with their feet without ever having to see it, just by hearing it. So that hearing is extremely important, which is another reason why they have that silent flight. If you can imagine that sound that those feathers make and you're trying to hear that tiny little mouse, you're not going to be able to hear that mouse over the sound of your own feathers. So, uh, so that hearing and that silent flight kind of work together with that. What are you looking at? All right. Um, so you also notice that it's a very flexible neck. And so those eyes are so big, they are fixed inside their head. And so they're able to turn their head and look 270 degrees all the way over their other shoulder. So not quite all the way around. <laughs> I'm sorry, he's one of our newest birds. And so we were trying to like figure out which, which one to put him. I'm like, well, I guess you're riding in the, the big box today. <laughs> um, now, the 11 species that we have, at least in Wisconsin, are the saw one as the smallest. Then we have the screech, the short-eared owl, the long-eared owl, the barn owl, and the barred owl, the gray horned, the snowy, the great gray, the boreal owl, and the northern hawk owl. So those are the 11 that you'd be able to find in Wisconsin. I suppose maybe the great gray and the boreal probably don't make it as far south as Iowa. Now, the reason we actually have Darwin uh, is, and the reason I know her exact age is because Darwin actually hatched right at our facility at our house. Uh, so we are involved in an organization called the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators. It's a, an association devoted to the care of of any type of bird that has to be in captivity. So they're constantly doing studies on how to best care for the birds, how to best train the birds, and how to best educate with the birds. Uh, and so Joe and I are always staying up to date on the best way we can care for any bird that is in our care. And one of the things they recently discovered is that owls who are injured as adults don't adapt well to captivity. They actually did a study on the cortisol levels, the stress levels that were in them. And because they're a nocturnal animal, it was really very hard for them to adapt. But owls that came in as babies or very, very young did excellent. They were just fine. Um, and especially if they were what we call imprinted on people. So if a baby was raised by a person instead of by their parent and they imprinted on people, um, they were able to adapt and spend their whole lives in captivity with very little sign of stress. And so his parents were both injured out in the wild. Uh, his dad actually ran into a window and had a head injury, and his mom was uh, most likely hit by a car, and she had a wing injury. And so they weren't able to go back out into the wild. And so when they came to our facility, we could tell that no matter how much training we did with them, they did not get uh, comfortable in front of people. So we were able to pair them up, and now they're part of a breeding uh, program that we have going on at our facility, where instead of doing programs, they just get to breed and have babies. And uh, at, they, this year um, was our first year. They graced us with two little baby solid owls. So when they were about a week old, we were able to take them out of the nest box and hand raise them so that they would be comfortable in front of people. 
Now his sister, his sis, her sister probably, um, actually got sent to uh, Eugene, Oregon to the Cascades Raptor Center. Um, they're actually the facility that did the study on owls and they're the facility that got us his parents. Um, so in return, they got to get the second baby that hatched um, with us. And now she, uh, her name is Maple now, and uh, she gets to be an ambassador uh, for, the, for her species over in Oregon. And Darwin will get to stay with us and be an ambassador here for his species. Um, they joined our family on Earth Day. Um, that's where he gets the name Darwin, and his sister used to be named Francis after Fran Hammerstrom. Uh, but they got to rename her, so. Um, so I'm going to walk him around. And actually, before I do, a couple last things to talk about that we should always talk about at our programs is what you guys can do to help wildlife. So there's a lot of things you guys can do, um, really easy at home. Of course, we talk about the use of insecticide. Um, so not only refraining from using insecticides, but planting native gardens in your own yard to attract native wildlife, native insects, um, pollinators, all of that is gonna be really great. If you don't wanna mow your lawn anymore, just plant a bunch of native plants and you're gonna be doing a lot to help the environment. Um, Rodenticide, another really big one, especially for owls. If you use uh, poison to kill any of the mice in your house, of course those mice don't die right there. They end up making their way outside and anything that eats them will get poisoned. So sticking to mouse traps are the best way um, to get rid of any mice or problems like that. And the last one we always like to talk about, especially with the bald eagles here in Decora, is lead. Um, so I used to work at a rehab center up in Anago, Wisconsin, which is where several of our birds came from. And we saw a lot of lead poison cases coming in, um, whether it was eagles eating deer that had lead in them, or uh, we also got a lot of swans and loons that ate lead sinkers because they would eat the gravel to help digest their food. Um, so switching your bullets over to copper, talk to Joe, he loves them. Um, or switching over your sinkers from lead sinkers to um, other different types of material that you can use. Um, and all of that is going to do wonderful, wonderful things to help, uh, to help our wildlife to keep them safe. So, if you guys have questions, I'm going to pass it to Joe so that I can walk this cute little guy around and you guys can take a closer look at him. I'll start on this side this time. He'll change color a little bit, yeah. So they're kind of like a gray, see these kind of like white spots? He'll get that on his back as well, and he'll lose the brown on his chest, and it'll be like a very brown. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Comments, yeah. <laughs> Darwin. Yeah, oh yeah, River Valley Raptors, you want to see baby pictures, that's his Facebook page. A lot of dogs. Videos of him on Facebook. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they have. I haven't dove into it that much. Um, he was asking, like, how how do they think? Yeah, how do they think owls kind of got derived from their ancient ancestors, right? So how does an owl get all those? That's a good one. Yeah, I do know they think peregrines are related to parrots because if you watch a peregrine eat, they'll grab stuff with their their foot and hold it like a parrot grabs a nut. So they think somewhere down the line in history, the parrot and the peregrine, like falcons, have split off. And we can even see it in the little kestrels even do it. They'll grab something with their foot and eat it with their foot like a parrot does. Yeah, it could, it could have been a niche thing. Yeah, they, the environment saw that that nighttime little space there was was open and, you yeah. know. Yeah. That's, that's the miracle of Mother Nature. You never know what's going to happen sometimes.